Hello everyone. Welcome to Dive In. Welcome on board. <laughs> so, what's our topic? Well, first we'll start off. Um, I'm Liz Taylor and I'm a underwater uh, explorer and entrepreneur and business person. She builds submarines, <laughs> wrangles engineers. And you? I am a, an oceanographer and also an ocean explorer been splashing around in the ocean for, oh my goodness, since about the time that we first saw Earth from space. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at Earth from under the sea. Under the sea. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about um, living underwater. It's, a, it's one of these things that's intrigued people for um, many, many years, uh, starting off, I guess, back in the 1800s or even before. We, here in the library, we have this copy of the uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. <laughs> so there you can see the cover. Look at these guys and their diving equipment. The, the science fiction often inspires what actually comes to pass. And Jules Verne, who was the author, had so many great ideas about the future that have actually come true. Um, so coming true, among other things, is living and working under the ocean. It's as, as far-fetched as the ideas of going to the moon, <laughs> you know. And I know you like to start every episode of Dive In with this image of Earthrise. It really gives us a, a reminder that um, we live in a very delicate, delicately balanced life support system and the, the, ocean, the ocean is the main feature. And the world is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed it is. Splash in, dive in. That's dive it. in, here we go. <laughs> So uh, this idea of living underwater is really um, kind of precipitated uh, by the science fiction world, by Jules Verne, by people really trying to dive in and, and wondering about how it would be to be able to extend their time to live underwater. And actually working underwater comes with a whole series of really um, physiological challenges to the human body. We and don't have gills. We don't have gills, no. Uh. <laughs> We've got to take our life support system with us, take our air uh, supply with us. But what happens to scuba divers is when you go down into the ocean, um, your, your blood and your body tissues become saturated with, um, or they, you know, the nitrogen in the air that you're breathing, the compressed air, um, is sitting there. And as you are there, you need to slowly return to the surface so those bubbles have a time to dissipate and it makes your ascent um, safe and comfortable. But saturation means you stay long enough for the nitrogen to fully, quotes, saturate your tissues. You can't take them any, up any more. That happens certainly in 24 hours, yep. somewhat less. But then the great cool thing is, and this was researched by a number of doctors and physiologists back in the 50s and 60s, uh, Al Benke and George Bond, they called him Papa Topside. Papa Topside, that's right. <laughs> he, he was the, the genius behind the Sea Lab program, and they figured out that once you've saturated, it depends on how deep you go, but you can stay for as long as you like once you're saturated. The decompression time, the time that it takes to get back to the surface, is the same. If you go deeper, it takes longer. But it's a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. So from s the saturation systems that you see here, that was an idea that caught the imagination of, who else? Jacques, Jacques Cousteau. Cousteau. <laughs> this, is, this is aptly called the Starfish House. And as you can see, it has sort of a, a center hub and arms that come out. Um, five of them. Five of them, just like a starfish. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had other ones um, that really drew upon nature as well. The conch shelf looked like a, a sea urchin, um, but without the spines. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, again, drawing on, on nature for design inspiration in quite compelling ways. So Ed Link was in parallel. Ed Link started the, what is now known as the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution in Florida. But he, in parallel with, with um, Bond and Cousteau, really experimented with 
what it takes to press the limits by using helium instead of of nitrogen as uh, to, to mix with oxygen mm -hmm. so you can go deeper uh, they actually did that with the initial experiments going back to 1962 but in the end um, well it led to what you're seeing on the screen right now right and I think that what one of the really interesting things is that during the whole sea lab program part of what drove their funding and drove the funding for for this habitat the tektite um, was the realization that sea and space are just like this when it comes to exploration. It, they're harsh environments. They're not really very friendly to our frail bodies. And we have to take our own self-contained life support systems with us. And while we can you know, kind of defend ourselves somewhat from the cold with different diving suits and so forth, um, we have to have a habitat that we can go live in, just like astronauts have to have um, space station. Space station. <laughs> or uh, before that, Skylab. Skylab, yeah. right. Yeah. So they really saw these parallels and uh, NASA and General Electric worked together to fund this tektite habitat. Um, Scott Carpenter, the astronaut, actually s spent a 30-day um, stint in Sea Lab, and that again kind of paved the way for uh, astronauts who wanted to train in tektite. But they he came um, to visit tektite. That's right, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and so, so I think we've got a. I know, and then you in twice. 1970. Hmm? I think he did twice. Oh. Here we go. There's because some astronauts floating by the same way that... Uh, That's how I feel when I'm underwater, you know, just gliding along without a lot of effort. <laughs> Coming through a hatch. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you're walking in space or diving in the ocean, it's that sensation. In fact, astronauts train underwater so they can simulate what it feels like when they go off into space. So... Maybe next. So the tektite habitat, um, it really gave you, I mean, in 1970, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of your tektite 2 mission um, this week. It was what, July 6th, right, when you um, took the plunge there? That's right. And, and the, the, reporters, report. the reporters sent you off, the all-women's team, and what did the reporter ask? Hey, are you guys going to share one hair dryer together? <laughs> are you going to wear <laughs> lipstick? Why? For the fish? For the fish. <laughs> but maybe you can tell us what was it like? What did you learn? Well, I think the miracle is that they allowed women to be a participant in this program at all. They didn't expect women to apply. Um, but when some of us did, and our qualifications were at least as good, <clears throat> maybe a in some cases a little bit better <laughs> than some of the <laughs> male applicants. There were actually 10 missions in all. But they couldn't stand the idea of men and women living together once they decided that maybe they should at least give us a chance. Uh, they actually said there might be hanky-panky on the reef if you have mixed teams. Oh, that was 15 years before there were women accepted in actually flying in, in space. In the space program, that's correct. But we did all right. We spent more hours actually in the water than it turns out than any of the men's teams and we were privileged to use rebreathers. It was in the early days of using these systems that do not emit bubbles. The air is recycled. The same kind of system that astronauts use when they make their so-called extravehicular activity. That's right. So it's kind of carrying your own life support on your back. That's right. You become like a little submarine. And without the bubbles, it's uh, less in intrusive to the fish. Oh, the fish accept you as one of their own. <laughs> here's the, the, oh. <laughs> here's the, great, uh, the great meals. I remember we, we had to test these out. As, as, as a kid, I remember receiving these test meals at home. Stouffer's frozen food. And tang. And, and tang. space food sticks. <laughs> even space ice cream. So inside, we tried to make it as comfortable as possible, but actually our goal was to be outside as much as possible. We had a hot shower, we had uh, television, not linked to the surface. We can only look at pre-recorded programs, but the program that interested us was the live action through the window if we don't, weren't actually outside ourselves. Fish streaming. Yeah, exactly. 
But you and, were also watched pretty closely oh, by yeah. the top side, yeah? You can see one of my pals, the one who's sitting in front of the screens. That's Alina Zmont. She's a PhD from Tulane University, oceanographer. And, um, it, you know, we could watch the watchers who were 24 hours a day taking notes about what we were doing. Uh, this is part of NASA's behavioral study. And they did put a shower curtain on the... Thankfully. Yeah, but, but we could also watch the fish outside. We could watch... They, anyway, it was a lot of watching was going on. Watching. <laughs> But that was part of the experiment too, to see how people would react um, really in in uh, close quarters and, mm -hmm. and kind of isolated to get self, well not self isolation, but isolating together for extended periods of time. Right, well actually we were not supposed to connect except virtually with other people. Right. So that was part of the simulation of what it would be like in space. So. And from, from um, Tektite, um, it's it's uh, really kind of opened the door to a whole new era of it was like a proliferation of small habitats, smaller habitats that kind of came along. Mm -hmm. And in the seventies, it was predicted that there would be cities underwater. Maybe someday there will be, but for a while, you know, countries uh, all over the world, Australia had a little habitat. Uh, Germany had the Helgoland habitat, um, Japan. Have. Oh, and and yeah. students at the University of New Hampshire created Edelhab, which mm -hmm. I also had a chance to use. I've actually had now ten times living underwater in mm, several variations on the theme of underwater labs. But Tektite was the first. And well, Tektite was really kind of luxurious. A lot of them were more like underwater camping. They called it this one. Tektite Hilton. <laughs> yeah, Tektite Hilton. So there you are. My expertise is with seaweeds, and I'm showing Peggy Lucas, the engineer, who was 23 and had no diving experience before the project, but they couldn't find a woman who was a diver and an engineer. They figured it's easier to train an engineer to dive than it is to train a diver to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and so Great. Peggy yeah. had her master's degree and was very sharp and was a good buddy. That's yeah. great. Here, oh, here you are. Out and about. Out and about. We could spend as much as 10, 12 hours a day out in the water because you have unlimited time. Diving in and out from the surface, your tissues accumulate nitrogen, of course, but here, once we were saturated, for, <laughs> saturated for 24 <laughs> hours, we couldn't take up any more, and decompression time was the same. But we were breathing a mix, not just of air, which is about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Because of the, of the the effect oxygen has under pressure, it, it can become toxic. Mm -hmm. So we had 8% oxygen, 92% nitrogen. It took us 19 hours to decompress. But anyway, it was worth it. Worth it. Had <laughs> as much time as we wanted, day and night, to be out actually exploring and coming back to headlines all over the world. I think as a scientist, I didn't get a lot of attention about the work that I was doing on seaweeds and fish and all that, but as an aqua babe. That's right, the ticker uh, tape parade, <laughs> literally. We, we became uh, notorious, let's say, around the world. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about the ocean. But people wanted to know about hair dryers and things like that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> anyway. But going back to the, you know, to the Hydrolab project, it was, again, it, one of these small sort of under, underwater camping sites, if you will, that um, was set out at the edge of a drop-off, which you can see here in this image. And it really was another, another one of these opportunities where you were talking about Ed Link before you can see his... Uh, vessel up there on the surface and off the edge and off the edge and going mm -hmm. deeper but taking a submersible to go from the habitat down into deeper water and then mm -hmm. coming, coming and back. allowing us to go out of the submarine and then come back into the submarine under pressure and then return to the underwater laboratory it was like a taxi yeah exactly <laughs> but here's dear little hydrolab this was the most successful underwater program until aquarius came along for it was 
started in 72 and until um, on into the 80s, the Hydro, Hydro Lab took literally hundreds of scientists, mostly scientists, but, but others had a chance to participate, reporters and even artists were able to go. And even you. Even me. <laughs> at, at the grand age of 14. Oh, look at that. Yeah, here I am coming up through the hatch. I was actually <laughs> delivering some ice cream um, and I got a really good lesson in Boyle's Law because the ice cream I delivered had kind of shrunk in the container. So they felt like they were being cheated because they didn't really get as much ice cream. It, was, it hadn't really changed, but the air was kind of pressed squished, out of it. Yeah, it was, squished that, out of it. That kind of, uh, there, there's ice cream and there's ice cream. Some are more compressible than others. <laughs> But one of the things that's really interesting to me is that every time I go down to make a delivery to the hydro lab, um, there was a big barracuda that hung out right underneath the buoy at the surface. And you knew that it's that same fish. Oh, fang. Yeah, yeah, fang. Exactly, fang. <laughs> but um, how long did it really take you to start recognizing the individual fishes that lived around the habitat? Well, you know, like most people, I had seen fish in aquariums. And if you have an aquarium, you get to know your individual fish, they have different behaviors and personality. You kind of get that. But most people only see fish on a plate. <laughs> they don't see a live fish, don't see their faces. It, it happened very quickly, actually. The, the, the fish that you can see in this image, it's, it isn't just the colors, they're expressions. I, I challenge people sometimes when they go to an aquarium, look at, look at them, look at their faces. And if you see fish of the same species, you'll soon, I mean, anybody can do it. Kids are really good at this. They're, they're no two exactly alike, just like cats and dogs and, dare I say, humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And, you know, it's been 50 years this week since that Tech Tight 2 mission. Mm. And, you know, the, one of the things I find most remarkable today is that instead of seeing that sort of plethora of small habitats around the world and people getting to spend time, meaningful time, mm. studying these systems, today we are down to just one scientific habitat in the world. And we have one retired habitat, which was converted to a subsea lodge, appropriately called the Jules Verne Lodge. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> in the Florida Keys. In the Florida Keys, where pe you know people can go and have kind of a, a overnight vacation. Uh, it, uh, under the water, but, but I mean, honestly, we should be seeing this, this sort of, um, I don't know, just like hundreds of these things so that we could really spend meaningful time underwater, but. Or, or at least adequate support for the Aquarius. Um, astronauts train there. In fact, it's NASA support that really gives a lifeline to the existence of the Aquarius that is now operated by Florida International uh, FIT. International, yeah, International University. Yeah, FIU. Sorry. FIU. <laughs> but it's yeah. um, but it's just it's really kind of it a used to be a publicly supported institution with NOAA as the primary backer, but that support faded away sadly. Yeah, it just as recently as 2012, the whole National yeah. Undersea Research Program was zero funded by the government, kind of leaving even Aquarius at great peril. You know, and, and the whole initiative of, although oceanographic research does continue undersea, that is taking people, your brain, your body, yourself, into the ocean has been neglected. You know, investing in aviation, aerospace, it's paid off handsomely, and we've been neglecting the ocean. And, you know, I think we're... It's we're costing paying. us. It's costing us dearly. Yep. We, we're, we don't have the information that we need that comes from real live humans and they're all the it, what experience and knowledge that they bring to the ocean. And, and we look at the, you know, the vast number of, well, just the material science, the, all the different uh, marine electronic science that's come along in the last 50 years and all this technology we can bring to bear mm. that would make uh, creating next generation underwater habitats um, you know, easier, cheaper, better than better. ever before. Right. And we see, you know, here you, you've adapted some of the kind of commercial diving um, technology to, to visiting Aquarius. I could speak to, I, I oh, was here you a go. moment of zen <laughs> on the John Stewart show back in 2012. 
Ta-da! There she goes. Was, uh, we, we were connected live back to the surface. Uh, on a, a pre previous mission, um, we could connect to, you know, do telephone calls to people, you know, phone home, phone home, like E.T. Yeah. And, and we did. Oh, i got to stop, stop sharing my screen somehow. So we'll get into that more on our, our next chance to dive in with all of you to go deeper, stay longer, and I hope really inspire in some of you whatever it takes to get out there and down there. Diving, absolutely, we need to do that. Every no child left dry, we need to get out there and splash around ch uh, children of any age, but to go in little submarines, to live underwater, to get to know this planet. Uh, I think we're also gonna at some point talk about robotics. Oh, we definitely will do that. And you you have been a real pioneer in working with engineers to devise ways and means to simulate our presence going deep. And, and certainly in commercial diving, the combination of saturation diving and robots and even submarines still thrive, but especially robotics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can... Um, we're happy to take questions as they come in, and I think we might have a couple. But let's talk. Let's see about some. Uh, what some of our viewers are <laughs> eager to find out about living underwater. Uh, Laura's asking us: Could funding of underwater labs help coastal cities understand the sea level problems? Hmm. So, not only sea level problems, but if you could actually see. <laughs> what it's like, or even go down as a visitor. Um, if the, these underwater stations could be a, places where you could invite the mayor to come down and see what the backyard of the city is like. Imagine putting one out in San Francisco Bay. There, there, <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little chilly, but... <laughs> well, but it, for a while, but, it, yeah. there was a plan to take the Tektite oh, yeah. lab and, and install it right here. Oh, I remember seeing it tied up at a, at a local dock. Yeah, it, in it, San Francisco. It, it, yeah, it was kind of It would take unnerving. some modification, but to see the constituency of, of those who live underwater naturally, like the fish and the Dungeness crab, and also to see the junk that's out there. Right, oh. to really see the impacts firsthand. I mean, that's right. one of the things I think that's so um, important about initiatives like Habitats is that it gives people a reason to care. They, mm -hmm. once they, you know, they know that fish or they know a place. I mean, if you look back to where the tektite is, um, that area is fundamentally changed from how it was mm. when you um, carried out those missions. Well, it took me a while to get back there. I was there, la you know, from 1970. It was not until, well, only about three, four years ago that I did go back. And what I recall were those beautiful staghorn and elkhorn coral reefs that we yeah. had to thread our way cautiously through so we didn't break them or, or harm them. They're gone. They're just gone. They're tiny little pockets here and there. Some of the big boulder coral still remains, but the fish, they're just little guys. The big ones are gone, not yeah. one shark. I found only, saw only one grouper and there were 12 different species of groupers evident. We have taken so much so fast, even though there's a national park on the land and there's some respect for the surrounding water there in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, it's sad to see how swiftly mm -hmm. we have actually taken from the sea the life. Decimation. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there's still hope. Well, the good news is when <laughs> there's you stop, absolutely hope when when you do protect an area that's what what the what it's all about with marine protected areas what we're trying to achieve with mission blue mm -hmm. with hope spots what around the world it, it's an idea that seems to be catching on like national parks an idea that some say best idea America ever had to well, to emulate that to to actually expand it and um, James is asking us, um, 
So why don't we build the momentum to construct a large international undersea station? Oh, I like you. I love you. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> in, a, in a sense, that's what Aquarius was um, designed to achieve, international participation. And there have been aquanauts saturated in Aquarius um, from other countries. And you're absolutely right. And, and what a list that would provide. And, and even Cousteau was, uh, you know, working hard to do that with the Con Shelf program. Yep. He had Con Shelf one, two, and three, mm -hmm. um, moving into deeper water, kind of having uh, habitats where people could connect to one another, um, different missions going on simultaneously in the Red Sea. And you know, so there's an excellent blueprint there that there is. can be picked back up again. And Cousteau's grandson. Is has embarked on a mission to to try to really develop a interest. He, he actually that's his Fabian yeah. um, Cousteau. Um, did a thirty-one days saturation. His grandfather's longest stay was thirty days. Yeah, so just so, to show he could do it. Just just a, just a, a hair of her, uh, uh, Scott Carpenter. <laughs> yeah, and but the um, but he's and, tr trying to. Do exactly what you're proposing. Build, build more interest right. and support. And Joshua is asking us, what is the deepest underwater outpost that could be stationed? And what would be the largest engineering challenges associated with that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. You know, saturation <laughs> diving has limits. For practical purposes, for, you know, I want to say ordinary divers, but I don't know any ordinary divers, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but, but you know, for a wide range of people in reasonably good health, having a station that is the way m many of them were destined to be back in the, in the 70s, stationed at about 50 feet or maybe 20 meters, 30 meters is pushing the edge a bit. But to go deeper, there are physiological limits. Now, in industry for oil and gas mm -hmm. exploration for maintenance and for pipeline surveys and for a lot of work saturation diving continues today even to as much as 500 meters yeah it's incredible work but, that they do using diving bells and chambers mm -hmm. and and so forth and, and it's it's hard and grueling work it's, it's with not, long decompressions very long spend decompressions. two weeks in a chamber after a dive to 300 meters but it's in some cases, the best solution to solve a problem is to send a human. Robots are getting better and better, but there's no substitute for human dexterity and the human problem solving capability. So, but beyond that, there is no limit, literally, to how deep we could live underwater if we just say we're going to do it at one atmosphere and use either one atmosphere submersibles, little one-person systems that wrap around a human <laughs> the way, you know, a diving suit wraps wraps around you, but having a self-contained air supply, mm -hmm. like astronauts, to be able to go either in a bubble, little bubble subs, and we'll talk about that next time, because right. to have one atmosphere suits to protect individuals when they're doing the equivalent of an EVA going outside the underwater station to roam around over a wide area in little bubbles. Look, it sounds like science fiction, but it's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's taking us so long to have that, that sense of urgency, that sense of wonder of wanting to go. It's there to be done. I want to do it. Don't you want to go and see what the fish are doing down in the deep sea? Yeah. I really do. And, and you know, um, Mike here had asked about how many habitats currently exist. And, you know, as we were saying, just the one Aquarius exists today worldwide. For science. For science. And, and research. And so it's a... For, for industry, there are these saturation facilities. It's, it's uh, definitely um, Spartan in terms of comfort, but and decompressions are in chambers um, and it's, I mean, I really salute the 
guys who are, and most of them are guys, as yeah. it turns out, <laughs> do that uh, work. Who, take, who take that on. Uh, a lot of that originated right here in California, where we are now, around Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. uh, and in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico did a lot of, quotes, shallow saturation dives, that is, <laughs> less than a thousand feet. <laughs> <laughs> in the North but Sea as well. North Sea, yeah, yeah absolutely. And mm -hmm. Uh, also, uh, Japan really has yeah. done quite a lot in saturation diving, and Russia. Russia had a program concurrent in the 70s uh, with the, the same time that Tektite and uh, these other underwater laboratories, and just as with the space program, Russia and the U.S. have been sort of <laughs> lockstep look, doing various look explorations. You, look who you have a question from right here. Well, who? Tell me. Oh, Katie. Oh my goodness, Katie. Katie's calling us or speaking to us. and it, She's the astro babe. Astro babe, <laughs> stop that. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she was telling us that her father was involved in Sea Lab as a project officer for building of that habitat. And she was privileged to follow in his footsteps and spend 11 days in Aquarius. She'd like to know what is the biggest challenge in your experience of living underwater? Coming back, I, I want to stay longer. I mean, I do. I mean, it's always uh, like you just don't have enough time to do all the things that are there to be done. And you've made friends or acquaintances at least with your neighbors and you don't want to leave them. But yeah, that big, that big uh, moray eel that we called Puff he looked like a Puff the Magic Dragon who lived near the Tektite Laboratory. Um, it was just, and the five angelfish that came out every Oh, those morning. angelfish, yeah. You've got yeah. some great, great memories of those guys and yeah, wonderful animals. And the but, Garden of Garden Eels. It, it, I mean, they're here in my mind, but it was, it was a sad time to have to come back to the surface. Yeah, it really was. Um, I just want to remind everybody that it's uh, entirely possible and encouraged to raise your hand if you want to ask us any live questions and our moderator will let us know when we have some hands raised so that we can uh, try to talk to people live. But in the meantime, um, James is asking if it would be a good idea to have a habitat that is uh, you know, kind of more portable so it could be moved around the ocean. Uh, he's saying that the military spends $730 billion a year on the military. So why couldn't we, uh, <laughs> we could at least have one at least portable habitat. I think there's a place for both. One of the great things about Aquarius is that for the whole length of time, I mean, it was more than two decades, it's still, still there. There are studies that document that place over a period of time. And you get, and even with, with Tektite, in the year, well, two years, because there was a team, Tektite One, involved four guys who actually stayed for two full months. And they weren't just there as guinea pigs, although they were that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, but they also uh, conducted studies on, on the lobsters and the, the sharks, the local creatures, and tracked them around and got to know them. Um, and there's a baseline of information. There are very few places either on the land or in the sea, but many more on the land than the ocean, where we have records of changes over time. We need to do a lot more of that. So I love the idea of having portable, movable saturation facilities or even one atmosphere transportable facilities. There's no reason why we have to limit ourselves to our physiology. That's true. Our astronauts don't have to expose their Poor bodies to a vacuum, or basically you know, yeah. the lack of atmosphere in space. Um, it's not a limiting factor going high. But why? Why do we consider? It, it was a big deal until 1960, when Jacques Picard and Don Walsh actually went at one atmosphere in the Trieste mm -hmm. to the deepest part of the ocean, 11 kilometers down. The pressure 16 thousand pounds per square inch but they did it they didn't stay very long but then fast forward 52 years when James Cameron actually built his own little one-person sub 
and you and DOER helped with the human factors and built oh, yeah. a manipulator arm. Sure. That made it possible to actually work while there. So that was 2012. And now just this past year, starting in 2019, but now in, into 2020, um, with Victor yeah. uh, uh, Escovo doing repetitive dives in a submarine that is it takes two people and Kathy Sullivan, yeah, astronaut, ast astro babe, <laughs> got to be one of them just a few weeks ago. So uh, Natalia, she's asking about uh, going in and out of the habitat. How do you get, if you're wearing the diving equipment, and how do you get in and out of the habitat easily? Can you explain to some of that? And then after we answer this, then uh, I think Cassie is waiting and she's good. And uh, we can call on her and okay, she great. wants to talk. Sure. But, All right. But tell us, how do you get in and out of that habitat? Well, imagine a boat with a hole in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think it would yeah. sink, that water would come in. But the inside of the habitat is, it's a, it's a container. It's like a big tin can like a trailer if you will but the hole in the bottom because of the pressure inside it's just a little bit greater than the pressure outside water does not come in so it's the picture that we showed of you coming just through the door up. yeah it seems miraculous i mean it, it seems contraintuitive that you could be underwater warm and dry there's a hole in the floor that's like a you know, it's a it's a pool. Mm -hmm. It's actually an entrance that takes you to the big pool, the, the ocean, that has no walls. Um, so you just climb up a ladder from the ocean into a dry space, and there you are, you're yeah. home. And at the end of the mission, you close the hatch, and you you bring the pressure down to surface pressure. It takes for the Aquarius, it's about a 14-hour um, decompression re so that you become readjusted. You lose the nitrogen, and you're back at one atmosphere inside the Aquarius. Okay, so then how do you get back out? There's a, a lock. You have to go into a from one atmosphere to a pressurized chamber, and then when that is equal, equalized with the outside pressure, you can swim out of that and push back home again. Back up to the you surface. You have to dive, re retreat back to the surface. But the whole process of kind of, it's like, it's almost like coming in from a, you know, a, a really bad winter day when you have all the, all the, all the layers gear. of jacket and gear and, and so forth. And you almost have, it's like an underwater mud room or mud porch. Yep. We and call it the wet, 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 wet porch, right? Wet porch, wet room, right. <laughs> and so you, you know, that's where you kind of leave all that wet gear. Yeah. Um, and, and, and take a shower. Take a shower, and then you, you know, go Fresh in. Fresh water. Yeah, and then you go into the, uh, into the main. The drier part. Drier part, yeah. exactly. So there's a live so question is, uh, coming? Is Cassie there? She could unmute. Oh. Yes, hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, do you think that everyday citizens will be able to live underwater, and what will that look like? Why not? <laughs> you know, thinking about the early days of diving, it was a specialized thing. And today, well, when Liz, when you first were trained as a diver, there was, you were supposed to be 16 years old mm -hmm. and you were 14, but you did it anyway. Yeah, but so, I was diving even before then. So don't, <laughs> don't tell, you know. <laughs> Uh, under careful supervision, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no recklessness here. But now kids as young as 10, because we've learned how to stay safe. A lot of the early days was trial and error. Didn't know how, a lot of things that now keep us safe about your physiology and so on. And now at one atmosphere in the submarine, you know, when we do our little presentation and discussion about submarines, whole idea of everyone should be able to explore the ocean. How many millions go up in the sky in aircraft? What's holding us back from democratizing access to the sea? Divers can do it, but there's a limit to how deep you can go. I mean, safely because of the 
the toxicity of oxygen under pressure because you get silly with nitrogen if you go too deep and stay too long. Uh, you really have to obey the the laws of gases <laughs> Indeed, boy, yeah. and, and the effects on your physiology. But at one atmosphere, it's like getting into a car or into an aircraft. And I, I really look forward to the time when 10-year-olds or anybody, any age, uh, can get into, just as we get on an airplane or get into a, <laughs> a car, um, can go into, out into the ocean yeah. at any depth. We need to understand why the ocean matters to all of us everywhere. And it's, it's great to see the films. It's great to share the stories. But there's no substitute for actually being there. So we've got another question from uh, James is asking, uh, how do how is communication and um, you know, are other supply cables? How do things uh, power and so forth? How does that all come down to the habitat? Well, there's a <laughs> with the Tektite was designed by General Electric. There was a cable, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> cable. And we we joked that it was like a big kitchen appliance. Yeah. That, that there's a, a cable that was plugged in literally on the shore that supplied the power that ran the life support. And we also had fresh water supplied from the source on the, on the shore. With Aquarius, there was a surface platform that had um, was gasoline powered that provided the energy needed. But it, there, again, there's a cable connecting from the power source to the underwater lab with, and also the fresh water was supplied from a, a source on the surface. Now, hmm, in submarines, you have to take it all with you. That's right. Batteries. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever it is that you take with you, that's your life support, your air, your water, everything, food, something beyond granola bars. Hopefully. Hmm. And Stephanie's asking us, is funding the biggest reason for not building habitats? Are there any other reasons why these aren't being done? Well, funding requires the commitment. Somebody, whether it's private sources or as with the space program, it's a combination now of private and public, but it started out with public, you know, taxpayer funding. And with both James Cameron's sub and with Victor Vescovo's um, submersible, that's private funding. And with support for Aquarius now with the university operations, they rely in some measure on NASA for their support and other contracts that can, be, but it's also available for, for private funding. But yes, it, it's just somebody has to step up and supply the resources necessary. It's not a matter of engineering challenge. Not to say that it can't be better. And there are some battery technologies that will improve the longevity of being able to stay underwater with submersibles or with uh, other underwater um, actions. Yeah. But and one of our one of our other um, viewers had asked about, you know, like why did the why did the whole uh, funding program here in the U.S. shut down? And and it was mostly due to the kind of a, a conflict with wanting to fund a satellite instead, because the whole program was only about what four million dollars, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that they just you know they just wanted to do something you else. You say casually four million dollars. If I had four million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> I know so, what I would do with it. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, but, it's just a, so what I'd like to do is, is, uh, you know, take it out to all of our participants and just say, how would you design uh, the next generation of habitats? I'd love to see um, people send in some sketches or, you know, make some models, send us pictures, give us some hmm. idea of what kinds of thoughts are out there and, and maybe we can uh, take it to a next step. I've got a couple of teachers who have offered to to uh, judge any pictures or, or diagrams <laughs> or models that people want to send in and, and maybe we can get some uh, little contest action going on. You know, and just as with 
going high in the sky, going deep in the sea, now has history. We have breakthroughs that have been accomplished. We're not starting from from zero. We're starting with with a lot of knowledge that can make access to the sea progress really quickly if there is a constituency saying we really need to do this, whether it's through government support or through finding individuals who have the capacity privately to help foster exploration of the seas. And often it's it's personal, personal pleasure or d desire to go. What I really want to do is to open it up so that kids can see what I've seen. I, having a teacher in space was a great vision and ended, unfortunately, before <laughs> that came to fruition. But we should have teachers in submarines. Well, we've done that. We ha well, we have, but yeah. <laughs> we need to do more. We need to do more of it. It and... needs to be ordinary instead of extraordinary. Yeah. We need to have access to our planet. You can go out on camping trips, you can climb mountains. <sighs> but why is it so hard to get people really to be champions for ocean exploration when it's the part of the planet that keeps us alive? We're counting on all of you to help in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to go out there and get wet yourself, I mean, if you haven't next, already. Yeah, and next time we will be uh, tackling the subject of human-occupied submersibles, as we kind of alluded to a little bit um, in the remarks today. Um, but we're kind of out of time to talk today. So until then, remember, protect the oceans. As if your life depends on it. As if your life depends on it? Yes. Why? Because, because it does. It does. <laughs> does. It really does. Thanks, everyone. We really look forward to seeing you next time, and thanks again for joining today. Yep. We will first thank our hosts for host for dive in Dr. Sylvia Earl and Liz Taylor. This was an informative, informal, and really fun conversation on what we can learn about our planet and ourselves by looking at the planet through the lens of, of living underwater. And to each of you for attending and participating. If you have any additional questions or suggestions, please send them to mytownhallquestions at gmail.com or leave comments on Twitter at hashtag dive in with us. Thanks as well to our sponsors, Ocean Elders and Medley Media for hosting and producing this event. A recording of this conversation will be available on the Ocean Elders YouTube channel shortly. Please check out our new summer schedule of events and note that we are now live on Thursdays, not Fridays, through the summer. Check the Ocean Elders Facebook and Twitter feeds for all future events as many pop up impromptu. And please do send us your suggestions and topics that would interest you. For the book lovers, and we know there were many, including me, We've included a complete list of the books by Dr. Sylvia Earle for your reference. If you want to discuss any of these works online, even consider a reading group, please let us know and we'll make that happen. And finally, we encourage everyone to participate in the hashtag one thing campaign created by our sponsor, Ocean Elders an easy and fun way to join a global community of individuals who are adopting their lifestyles one little piece at a time, say get her hair of our planet collectively. See hashtag one thing on Twitter. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>